everyone. I'd like to introduce Dr. Fareed Bani Maud, otherwise known as Dr. B. Dr. B is the founder, CEO, and clinical director of American Addiction Institute of Mind and Medicine. This is a nonprofit intensive outpatient program for substance abuse and mental health. Dr. B is also the founder of Zephyr Medical Group. This is an outpatient medical clinic devoted to the full spectrum abuse with particular and significant effort at correcting, managing outpatient medication assisted treatment for opiate abuse. So welcome Dr. B, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help educate us about maintenance medication and the benefits it has for people in recovery as well as pain patients. So thank you. Thank you, Rock and Roberta. Thank you for having me on your channel. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be great. And uh, thank you for the introduction. This is great. Can you please tell us a little about your background and how you became interested in helping addicts in recovery? Sure. Uh, let me do the short version. My background is academic emergency medicine, which is basically uh, I was a clinical professor at uh, UCLA Kern Medical Center for years. And eventually I was at UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine. Uh, at the UCLA uh, Kern Medical Center, I was uh, also director of research and some other stuff. They give you all these titles. And the way this all kind of develop is uh, in the field of emergency medicine, especially when you're doing academic me uh, medicine, uh, you teach, uh, you see patients, you do research. That's what you do. Uh, one of the subcategories of fields in, in emergency medicine is toxicology and substance abuse sort of falls under that because overdoses, right? All kinds of overdoses. And what, I was always sort of attracted and had an affinity for heroin for some reason and the drugs. And I, it was a county facility, very busy county facility, amazing training ground. And uh, I became very interested and I did all the lectures in toxicology. Uh, about reversal overdoses and things like that. One of the things I noticed, one, not only, you know, I have a paper published in a, a, a professional trade journal on how to do rapid paracentesis for hepatitis C ascites in a county facility, things like that. I was very always interested in it. Um, I noticed a couple of things, and I'll make this as short as I can. One, I didn't like the attitude and care for my overdose heroin patients, okay? Uh, sorry, let's just get... And what I mean by this is such. Two things happen. One, I would have a heroin addict that would come in, and his thing was muscling uh, in his... I remember, I, in fact, I have pictures of it for teaching purposes for residents. He used to like to muscle in his right uh, uh, shoulder here. And eventually, it became necrotic, and he got what's called neck fash, and... Uh, plastic surgery had come in, they put a graft in, he was supposed to follow up, but I guess he was so underdosed with his pain medications, he left, and then he came back, and the whole shoulder was black, and, you know, everybody had sort of a attitude towards it I didn't like, whether it was my residence or the other services, and they were underdosing his pain medications, and I knew what had to be done. Number one, you have to respect his, you know, personhood and treat him like a human being, and because I knew how all these pathways work, he needed a lot more pain medication than the regular pain patient. And this kind of thing all the time was occurring and I didn't like it. The second thing I didn't like is this. When an overdose would come in, Narcan, which everyone knows now, it's sort of a stock and trade of an emergency medicine doc and we're really good at giving Narcan. Uh, in the field, the paramedics would give two milligrams of Narcan and uh, they would bring these guys in and severe precipitated withdrawal. So you just saved his life, great. But the general attitude was, you know, everyone was caring and committed to saving their life, but there was uh, this attitude because this guy would come out of precipitated withdrawal, wake up from death, and he was angry. He didn't know what happened. It's a homeless guy. He's a severe heroin addict. And he just, I don't know how he got his 20 bucks for the day, but he got his dope for the day, got high. Now somehow... We, you know, he owed us everything because we saved his life. He doesn't know what he's going. And what I used to do was, uh, you know, everybody would sort of like be very non, I mean, you know, I don't want to talk bad about the team or the other services, but it was like, whatever, the guys in pain, we just saved his life. I was like, 
No, I'm going to give this guy 10 milligrams of morphine, calm him down, right? Make sure he doesn't go out and do it again because I need to keep him 24 hours to look for all the side effects of what happened. You got to keep him so there's no pulmonary edema, reversal of the Narcan, all kinds of stuff. And I just thought the care was not cool. Meanwhile, I made my kind of transition to another university in Southern California, and there was a very, very deep corporization of academic medicine, which I didn't like. It wasn't for me, okay? I don't care how Excel works. I don't care about meetings. I don't care about ties and suits. You know, that's, that's just me. I, I, grew, I came up in an old school of medicine, even though I'm not as old as some of the old timers. And I was like, I don't want to go up into C-suite, which is what they call the kind of executive suite. I don't want to move up the ladder so I can wear a tie and suit and not see any patients. Meanwhile, I was starting really getting into dealing with more of the addict and had started a little side practice where I would see addicts one day a week. Uh, and I just kind of looked around, told my friends, uh, I said, I'm giving up my professorship. See you later. I'm out of here. I didn't really have the money or the finances to do this. And I always do. I guess that for them, it's kind of crazy, nutty things. But I was like, I'm done. I can do this better than everyone else. The, the, the system of care down here is horrible. I'm going to do this. And uh, that's four years ago. And the rest is history. I'm still doing it. And I've survived. Does that help? Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. It's, that's good stuff. And it's interesting, too, because one of the one of the things that kind of held me back from getting help was, and I hear this question from people all the time um, on my channel, well, if I quit and then I have, or I get on Suboxone and there's an accident, I have a major trauma, I get into a car accident and my arms ripped off or you know something really bad happens, what's gonna happen if I go to the hospital? How are they going to treat me? Am I going to get pain medicine if they know I have this, this mark on my record or if I'm on Suboxone? That is a huge thing that I hear from addicts almost every single day. How am I going to get treated when I go to the hospital and I'm on the Suboxone? Are they going to take care of my pain? What would you say to that? Um, uh, it's a two, it, let's dissect the question. One, it's the pharmacological and clinical part. And then one is the attitude of the healthcare profession towards the addict or someone on Suboxone. Uh, you're right. Uh, uh, there might be some attitude issues. I think that's slowly changing, okay? Uh, and what, one of the things I do is I should do it more and uh, be a lot more aggressive about it. With my patients, uh, I'm going to start giving out cards so they can give the practitioner or put it in their wallet, even bracelets, which is something I haven't really instituted yet, but I'm going to do that. Where people, in fact, I tell, give them all the time, I give them my personal number. I said, anybody gives you any kind of crap at the hospital or any facility, you have them call me immediately, right? So they need some sort of identification. The attitudes are changing, I think, depending where you're at. But I can't promise or guarantee that. But one of the ways we can mitigate it as providers is have a good conversation with our patients. And then I sh we should, and I'm going to start doing this since you brought it up, and I've been meaning to, is putting cards in their wallet or some sort of bracelet where that provider over there can call me immediately and I set things straight. I do this all the time with patients getting surgeries. Uh, I've had uh, a few girls now that have delivered and it was some of them was their second or third child and they got real big problems, attitude from the nursing staff when they delivered. But now I make sure, and it's up to the patient, make sure I talk to your OB educate them, tell them how we're going to manage the problem. And then when you get in, you know, I've had girls tell me, you know, my kid was born and they took my kid away and CPS was down there. And that has happened. And now with me getting involved, that doesn't happen. I make it very clear to the staff, don't mess with this person. She's doing great. If I have a concern, I will communicate that with them. Right, but if you're doing great and I don't have a concern, I, I'm I'm not lying to anybody. Whatever the issue is, I translate. But with someone that's completely stable, has their life together, I make sure the OB team knows. And same with that other thing. I can't really control the attitudes out there. I think they're slowly getting better. What can I do to make this better? I should give my patients uh, some sort of a card or bracelet where they can the healthcare provider can see it right away and contact me. And I'm hoping these attitudes change slowly but surely. I'm sure there's going to be people that write, they're like, no, this didn't happen to me. They treated me like crap. 
I understand. I'm sorry about that. But we can all, all we can do is fight it and try and find solutions, and we can do that. Yeah. That's, that's the, the second part of the question, sorry, is the clinical issue. If I'm Suboxone and I need pain medication, what happens? And nothing. The latest recommendations are start giving the pain medications. It will overpower the Suboxone in enough time. If there's any questions, the healthcare provider on that end should call me. If it's a planned surgery, you stay on the Suboxone. You get, depending on the surgery, number one, the practitioners need to have communication so they're on the same clinical page and they have an understanding of the long-term clinical sequelae. So what happens is they call me, it's a planned surgery. I tell them, stay on the Suboxone or increase it a little bit before surgery, depending on the surgery. Go ahead and give all of your pain meds. Tell me what the pain usually is for a normal patient afterwards. Oh, okay. And at that point, I will either manage it with Suboxone or if there's anything additional needed, I take over and I will put that on top of the Suboxone with a very, very close, intimate follow-up with the patient to make sure we don't get into any trouble. And, and that's how it should be done. I know it sounds ideal and it doesn't happen that way. I'm having really good success with my patients because I really, you know, I'm tough on this issue. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. That's a good answer. Um, you notice, though, in your field, do you notice a lot of people not wanting to get on Suboxone because of that issue as far as, well, if something, I, I mean, I've talked to so many people on my channel, if something happens to me and I'm in a horrible car accident, it's always a horrible car accident, what's going, you know, how are they going to help me? And it's, I, I think it's a really big fear for people um, to admit to their doctors, their healthcare provider, I am an addict because they're afraid um, letting that out to the med their, their medical practitioner that all of a sudden, nope, you're gonna be cut off from all pain medicine, you're gonna have to suffer if something really bad happens. I find that that's a huge issue for addicts. Okay, so let's take a couple of examples, extreme examples and explore it. If you're in a horrible, horrible car accident, God forbid, you're out cold. They don't know anything. They're going to put you out and start pumping you full of all of the sedation medication and pain medication. In that case, the worst thing that could have happened is right before the accident, you took a dose of Suboxone and that dose may be eight milligrams because most people divide it up. Either you're way too out of it in a coma to feel anything. If you are in a position to feel something, let's take the worst thing, you just took the medication and you got in an accident, they're gonna start pumping you full of fentanyl and, and they're gonna put you, uh, give you a lot of fluids. And in a very short period of time, the Suboxone is gonna wear off because you're gonna have so much pain medication that it's gonna eventually take over. If you go in and you're awake, what is one of the most painful things I've managed? I mean, this is stuff I, I've seen 36,000 patients in the emergency department doing this kind of thing. Uh, let's say you got broken bones with them sticking out. There's nothing more painful. Or gunshot wounds. I've managed hundreds of them, right? Uh, that's not always painful, but broken bones sticking out. Either your body has shut down when you're not feeling it and you're just kind of sitting there staring at it in some sort of shock. And in the case that it's painful, same thing. There's nobody in their right mind that's going to hold, withhold pain medication from you. The issue is that if you just took the Suboxone, uh, those receptors are full and it binds a lot tighter than, let's say, fentanyl. But in a very short period of time, they will push enough fentanyl and the Suboxone will start to come off and you will be okay. That is the last thing you should worry about. Uh, uh, because I just gave two extreme examples and, and both of those can be very easily overcome. You should not withhold your Suboxone because of that concern. I, I agree and I really appreciate you answering that. It's, it's definitely been an issue for a lot of people I've talked to. Um, what's the difference between methadone and Suboxone for pain management? And pain management? What, what do you prefer? Yeah. So, uh, uh, uh well, uh, specifically for pain management? Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I prefer, sub so the doses for pain management that the pain management doctors use is uh, much smaller than the doses for uh, maintenance medication for uh, addiction. So, the, the, so it's going to be a smaller dose. Uh, what do I prefer? Uh, again, it's per individual, 
but more and more and more and more what I've seen is people being on things like methadone and some other heavy drugs, fentanyl patch, lollipops, they don't have end of life issues and uh, all of the guidelines have changed. So what's happening is they're just getting cut off, okay? And most practitioners in the US don't really use uh, Suboxone type medication for pain. I do, and they come, and you know, people say it's not uh, uh, FDA approved for that. Actually, there are, it's not, but if you look at the history of this medication, this is what we should have been using for chronic pain instead of all the opiates that we use, and that's a very fascinating history going back to the eight, uh, early 90s, late 80s, and the big pharma. This is the medication you should use for chronic pain. If you're going to use an opiate, you should use this medication. And since I have so many people coming off methadone and starting this medication with me, they get referred to me from the university. I got a couple guys from out of the state that have been on this kind of stuff, methadone and other stuff for five, 10, 15 years. All of a sudden they got cut off. They come to me during severe withdrawals and, uh, and they want basically withdrawal management. And I'm like, well, you need to be on Suboxone. And from the people that I've treated, uh, it's life changing. In my practice, I do have chronic pain patients on Suboxone. I think it's a cleaner drug. I think it's a better drug. You don't build the tolerance. It's not an agonist like methadone is. It's an agonist antagonist, which really means you don't have the same euphoric issue. You don't have the increasing dose issue. You don't have the opiate-induced hyperalgesia which essentially means it's a paradoxical effect, which essentially means that when I have you on opiates in long term, it has a very interesting effect. And I won't go through the pathways on this if you want me to. Your pain sensitivity gets worse. That's the weird thing about being on chronic opiates. Suboxone doesn't have that issue. It has a ceiling effect and your dose stays the same. It's, 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 it's wonderful in that way. And so it's the ideal medication if you want to put a chronic pain patient on opiates. Again, it's, you got to talk to your provider. Uh, and it doesn't have the same issues as methadone. Does, does that answer a little bit of the question? I mean, I can go on forever, and I'm trying yeah, to uh, hit different parts of it. Yeah, that's great. Do you mention the ceiling effect? Um, so the question here, is there a ceiling effect? You mentioned this, what is the ceiling effect for the dosage? And also, um, basically, if, if you add more to the Suboxone, will you get a euphoric feeling? Yeah, so. yeah the, the, so this is how the ceiling effect is clinically described with Suboxone. Uh, whatever you're using it for, it's kind of nice, because theoretically, at 32 milligrams, uh, uh, the receptors are theoretically completely saturated at 32 milligrams, okay? Whatever you're using it for. Uh, that being the case, it's kind of nice. If I'm using, let's say, methadone, the receptors don't get saturated and I have side effects. The final one, one being respiratory arrest, whether I'm using heroin, methadone, or oxys, okay? And it's a curve that's a linear curve that goes curve this way. Whereas with Suboxone, the curve goes like this, and there's a saturation of 32 milligrams, you're done, okay? Now, I'm not telling you to take 50 of them, nothing's going to happen to you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying at 32 milligrams, the data shows clearly that you start to get a saturation effect, and you're done. That being said, there is some data that has come up, and i got to revisit it, that for some pain patients... If you go slightly above the 32 milligrams, it increases their pain score, okay? And I've experimented with that. And in my practice, although it's really not uh, indicated in that way, I do have a few patients that instead of taking 32 milligrams, they might be taking 40 milligrams a day. They're pain patients. I watch them very closely for abuse, okay? So that's that part, whether it's pain or addiction. For addicts, I've never I've rarely used more than four strips, but 16 to 24 milligrams is what the international data shows is the average dose that was taking care of withdrawals, cravings, and keeping a person at bay in the long term, 16 to 24 milligrams. 
Now, as far as euphoria, uh, you know, people will tell you to have euphoria when they take their first dose of Suboxone. Some will tell you, yeah, it gets a high. Many will tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. There's a potential quick euphoria if you're opiate naive, absolutely. But it's not really a problem for most people in the long term and if you titrate the dose up. You, if you're taking, and I have one patient that's still in that and uh, they just got cut off. If you're taking Suboxone for euphoria, you're, it's kind of idiotic, right? Uh, it just it doesn't really do it for you. Uh, and I can bring a dozen people in here and they'll tell me they'll, they've even used it uh, intravenously and it's kind of not worth it. So that dose of 32 milligrams is in consideration of whether you're using it for pain or addiction and it has a ceiling effect at 32 milligrams. That, that discussion does not include the euphoria. The euphoria discussion it, again, same thing, depends if you're used to it or not used to it, whether it's four milligrams, eight milligrams. But for the most part, I don't know too many people that tell, that are on it chronically that say they feel anything different. I mean, if you sat my clinic throughout the day, you have dozens and dozens and dozens of people going through that, all walks of life, all kinds of professions. Every single one of them will tell you this gets their life back. Some and I see that some of the comments I see and I might as well, every once in a while you'll get someone that, you know, I just, I'm not the same person on this. Okay, I don't deny it. And there's some people like that, but I deal with large number data and the number of people affect. So, you know, I think it's unfair when one person comes on and says, you know, I'm basically a walking dead soul on this medication. I, I respect that and I'm not denying it, but it's not fair to be telling that to the whole world. Maybe whatever your biochemistry and physiology is, this stuff doesn't suit you. But you know, I can tell you the same thing that patients would tell me about uh, blood thinner medication or, or hypertensive medication, right? You know, they just don't feel right. I, I get it and it is the case for some people, but in general, pound for pound, when you look at a large number of patients, uh, there's not much euphoria there, and it helps whether it's pain or addiction. Yeah, one reason why I started my channel is because, and this was over a little over three years ago, I was on a pretty high dose of Suboxone, and I was doing my research about uh, lowering my dose and tapering off and going through the withdrawal process. And I just found so much darkness on YouTube about, I mean, just people getting on and complaining and crying and whining about how horrible this was, you know, to come off of the Suboxone and, and what a horrible drug it was and stuff. And for me, I mean, it, it, it changed my life in a really good way. You know, it was a, it's been a really good tool for me to help me get my life back. And it also works as an antidepressant and an anxiety medication for me. And um, so when I started my channel, um, it's definitely been a process, but um, I, I just wanted to show people what it was really like to taper off, go through a draw. And I did, I successfully came off Suboxone for a year and a half and I had, um, I became a chronic relapser and I decided to get back on a low dose again. But yeah, it's, it's, um, there are a lot of horror stories for sure about this medication, but it, all the people that I've talked to throughout the years, it's helped a lot of people. There's a lot of good with it. Not on your own. There's data uh, and I see it every day that uh, uh, there are some studies that are actually using it for medication resistant and uh, depression. And yeah. it makes complete sense. And, and so, uh, in, in a secondary way, I use it that way all the time. And that tells me where your dopamine is. And it kind of tells me, are you someone that needs to be on this long, long, long term, right? Because some of these guys, the dopamine is running low. So that's one thing. And the anxiety, well, that's part of the long term withdrawal and if they're on the right dose where those uh, uh, mu receptors are fired up in the right way, the anxiety goes away. So when people come in, they want benzos and this stuff. I'm like, why don't we get this straight? And then we'll talk about any kind of anti-anxiety medication. And thirdly, the tapering off and all the horror stories, I'm going to have to say in general, there's two reasons for that. One, people are managing the medication themselves. 
So, you, uh, you know, in the same way you don't give someone insulin and say figure out your dose or when it's time to come off of it, that needs to be done by someone who really understands how to taper. I'll do anywhere from two months to two year tapers, okay, depending on you, right? So, and the first question is, who are you? Is it time to taper? How quickly should we taper? And are you really ready for taper? After I make that assessment, I give you my feedback, and then I now I've educated you, and it really it's up to the provider to do a right taper and make sure the patient has no fear because the other fear they have is, if I say I'm gonna taper, he's gonna cut me off. And I make sure they understand, no, this is my assessment, and if things change, and you're in agreement, we're gonna go back up, go back down, and take our sweet time. And uh, this is why you get the horror stories. A lot of it is self-tapering, or maybe aggressive physicians that uh, you know don't see this the way I do, and they taper it in the wrong way. But otherwise, you know, we taper people and bring our doses down all the time, uh, all the time. Now, the way that you dose your uh, your people who are in um, recovery versus your pain patients, do you dose them differently? Um, because I know a lot of people who are in recovery, they take their dose once a day, maybe in the morning, or they split it up um, morning and night. Do pain patients take their medication differently? Like, do they take it more times throughout the day, or how does that work? And we, I, uh, I'm a little more conservative because I'm looking for markers with pain, uh, but same thing. Uh, the only thing I care about is and when we initially do an induction, that's when you get the dose to where you need to. I'm very closely involved in the first few days. So we get the right dose, not too much. There's no reason to give too much if you don't need to. Not too little because you're going to relapse or the pain is not addressed. And once I get that uh, right, then I give you an education. Let's say we end up at 16 milligrams in the first two days and that's our dose. And you're asking me, well, how should I take this? I'm like, you tell me but I want to know the next two days. You want to take it four, 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 go ahead. You want to take eight and eight, go ahead. We need to figure out a way where during a 24 hour period, you're not having withdrawals, you're not having cravings, or your pain is well controlled. And, and, and you figure it out and then talk to me and I'll fine tune it and adjust it. So it's still within that 32 milligram range. Uh, look, I have a case and we're going to actually publish this this year in an academic journal. I have a case. Do you know what R, 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 uh, RLS is? Restless I, Leg Syndrome? Yes, yes. I have a case. Uh, this is an interesting case. Uh, you know, the variety of things I use it. This guy's had severe restless leg syndrome for years. And he's seen every top neurologist in, in, in the country to manage this stuff, at least in California. And eventually they ended up on Altram, which is actually a drug of abuse. But same thing happened that happens with all opiates. He's a great guy. He's a you know well-to-do guy. He's an artist, uh, and uh, he's in his 50s or 60s. And he started increasing the dose to manage his, he has severe restless leg syndrome. He started increasing his dose to manage the restless leg syndrome. Eventually he's like, wow, I'm addicted and I need more. And uh, I don't remember if they cut him off or they gave him a limited amount, but the restless leg syndrome was coming back ferociously. And that stuff's a nightmare. So he came for a complete detox. I don't want to be on anything. And I said, okay, we can do that. What's your uh, plan afterwards? And he's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have one. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. Uh, if you want to go through with this, understand that we need to figure out because if the restless leg comes back, you know, uh, what are we going to do? Go back to opiates? That didn't work out for you. So we played around for a couple months uh, after we did the detox and this stuff started to creep back up. And I had told them at that point, I already know, I think what's going to fix this is Suboxone. Okay. And it came back. And uh, over the last week or so, we finally got a very nice adjusted low, 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 low dose of Suboxone. And it's actually, I think it's two milligrams, if I recall correctly. He's sleeping like a baby without the restless leg. He has his life back. And we know we have to <coughs> continue this for the rest of his life. And, you know, I, well, I'm trying to get him to be comfortable with that. And he's pretty comfortable because he's suffered pretty badly the last 
couple months with the restless leg. So that's the variety of use that practitioners open their mind and uh, you get patients to, and you kind of approach it, understand how the receptors work, what it's solving. This guy has restless leg syndrome that's not resistant to medication and a small dose of Suboxone fixed it. And so whether it's two milligrams or 32 milligrams, you just gotta figure it out, pay close attention and move forward from there. Have you ever heard of a lot of um, people say on YouTube, different people who've had channels and stuff that they'll eat a raw potato to deal with restless leg syndrome? Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> It's a nightmare. There's people that make videos and they talk about how to handle your withdrawals and stuff like that. There's a lot of people eating raw potatoes out there. Um, anyway, so you're, uh, when you have a pain patient in your clinic, do you allow them to choose like what type of, um, whether it's like the patch and the Suboxone or an injection, um, there's different, you know, they have the pills and the strips. Um, do, do your clients get to choose how they want to administer that? Um, or do you generally? Uh, in the United States, the patch of Suboxone is called Butrans, okay? And it's a weekly patch you change. Now here's the odd, strange thing about all of this. It's the same thing as Suboxone, but it's indicated only for pain. Now Suboxone is not indicated for pain. And the only difference between them is one goes on here, one goes under your mouth. It shows you the insanity of the system. So just so you're aware, you know, uh, uh, there's a Butrans patch, which is Suboxone in a patch that's indicated for pain. That's having said that, when people come and eventually get to where they meet me, I don't have a pain clinic. People find me through odd, desperate ways eventually when things are, and I don't advertise as a pain clinic. I'm just starting to gather these pe people up because UCI knows I'll, I know how to deal with this. And when they come to me, I educate them Usually we start off on Suboxone strips and if they very usually they don't have a preference. Uh, I try to guide, depending on if, who you are and what your abuse history is and what I want to do, I try to guide you towards what I would like and I have no problem making changes given patient preference when the time is right. If you're talking about injection, we got to work up to that. I got to see where you're at, what the issue is. And it's not just, if you're asking only about pain patients, I don't have any pain patients on the injection. I may use it as such in the future, but right now, everyone's with the uh, sublingual. Most of them are on Subutex or Suboxone. And I have no problem if they have a preference. Uh, it has to fall, I have to have no clinical red flags. Uh, to go with it, but otherwise it, it, it doesn't matter to me. For me, it's to be able to control the dose and uh, and make sure you're not di you know diverting the medication to sales or abusing it, then we're okay. Dr. B, um, I have a subscriber who just subscribed to my channel and he was telling me that he is taking Suboxone every day um, and then there'll be a few days where he doesn't take it. And in between those days, he's not taking his Suboxone. He's injecting heroin. And so um, he's been in this, I mean, he's, he has not allowed himself to stabilize on his Suboxone. He's just, he keeps messing with it. And so I've been trying to encourage him to just give it a chance, do as his doctor is telling him and let it, let him stabilize. But do you think that the shot would be better for somebody like him and his position, somebody that can't just let get themselves stabilized? Would the shot be more beneficial? To Great question. Uh, again, I, without knowing the patient, I don't know the details. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, when I see patients like this, it's that the addiction is so strong, the frontal cortex is really dictating the midbrain in a really negative way. Uh, an option is the shot. Now, some people I force them to come into IOP or I force them to come into my office every three days uh, if they don't want the shot, I'm like, okay, you're going to get three days worth of scripts and you need to come in here, talk to me. And the, the, all those work. There's a couple of patients just like that where they themselves were on board and we went with the shot and it's working beautifully. There's one that I have like that, that waits till the end of the month when the shot's wearing out. And then she goes on a meth and uh, heroin run for about a week and <laughs> she comes in and gets a shot. So I'm like, well, we're not making prog uh, prog uh, you know, we're not progressing here because you're doing the same thing. And in her case, 
she needs to shut it down and come into a three to six month program until we get things going. So yes, depending on what your provider thinks, that is one of the options that may very well work for this young man is getting the shot. I don't know where he's at and his clinician needs to really make that evaluation and make the decisions, but that's one of the options that you can do and I have used it successfully for some of my patients amongst other options for someone in that case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so like that probably just really needs to get in. You know, maybe. Uh, it's very possible. Uh, I don't want to say anything definitive about anybody I'm not talking to, but that's one of, one of the things that someone like this may need. Right, right. Thank you. Um, so another question is, can you use other drugs while you're on Suboxone, like THC, benzodiazepines, alcohol? I guess because it's like, sure, take, take your subs and go out and do some meth, which, I, which is not what I'm advocating. Uh, you got to tell me the drug. Uh, I think you had a question about THC earlier, right? I mean, how, yeah, is that, I mean, is that, is it contraindicated or is it something that you shouldn't do with THC? The question is just very surgical about, is THC contraindicated with Suboxone? The answer is no. It's not contraindicated. Now, if you're asking me as a physician, do I advocate THC or, oh, yeah, it's okay, go and do that. I have a very different view on that nowadays for the substance abuse community. And you got to remember, I'm from Berkeley. So right. I, I grew up extremely liberal in attitudes towards THC. Nowadays, I really try to advocate my substance abuse patients, that cohort of people, to stay away from marijuana because of a whole bunch of other things that I won't get here. But strictly speaking, it's not contraindicated with marijuana, okay? okay. Uh, it's not contraindicated with alcohol, except you might ar argue that the two of them, since one is an opiate and you're taking a sedative hypnotic alcohol, the combined sedating effect uh, can increase your chance of death. And that would, that would be sort of reading without really understanding the depth of the literature of your reading. I'm not going to answer that here uh, mm -hmm. for, it's a long discussion. It's one I have with colleagues and academic folks all the time. Uh, I'm going to say, don't drink, don't do other drugs, stay off your, just stay on your Suboxone. There is some dangers mixing it with benzodiazepines and alcohol. I'm going to leave it at that. It's a very glossed over superficial answer, but it's the safest answer on a medium like this. Otherwise, I'd be irresponsible if I went to too much depth. Sure, sure. Okay. I appreciate that. I'll tell you something, Dr. B. When I first started taking Suboxone, I was a pretty heavy drinker. And then after about a year of taking Suboxone, I wanted to drink less and less. Go yeah. ahead, finish your thought. No, that, I mean, that was it. I just drank less and less. And I mean, I don't drink anymore because I'm in recovery, but... I mean, it get recovery, but I mean, it get I just didn't want to anymore. Mechanism wise, uh, and uh, this is the mechanism. Alcohol is a very, very complex, multi-system, uh, upper nervous system drug. Uh, it affects many, many systems, besides GABA systems, inhibition system, uh, serot all kinds of stuff. Well, guess one of the systems that it affects is your nucleus accumbens and your enkephalin, your opiate receptor system downstream. So here's one of the systems that affects, when I drink alcohol, one of the secondary systems that affects is it lights up my opiate receptors and it increases my dopamine in that way. Well, what does that do? Euphoria. So amongst the many systems that affects, this is one of the systems that affects, it lights up the same place that heroin lights up. What happens? I feel better. So let's take it as an example. I have, I have a crappy day. I go home. I have a couple of drinks. Now I can deal with all my stress. I'm like, this is good in the simplest way. I'm going to have another drink. Okay, so and this leads to addiction, etc., etc. But one of the ways I feel better when I drink is by lighting up my, uh, my mu receptor system, which is the same place that heroin hits and all those other things hit. Well, now I'm sort of blocking that system. So when I have that drink at some level, that secondary system of opiate receptors is not lit up. 
So it actually, potentially in theory, and we have shown this with naltroxone actually, it decrease, it should decrease my wanting a second and third drink. You still get drunk, you still have inhibition because there's multiple systems involved, but I'm sort of shutting down one of the systems that creates the euphoria for me to want to have more alcohol to get that good feeling I get. And that is why that you potentially started to drink less. You shut down the opiate activation system by having it filled with Suboxone, although it's a partial antagonist, it still is an antagonist, and the agonist part is already working, so you've shut down that system from alcohol because it binds probably much stronger than alcohol. Does that make I sense? Love, yeah, it does. I love that side effect, though. I love it. Keeps me safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> So let's see, will Suboxone affect my sex drive? Um, does it affect testosterone at all? Suboxone, any opiate long-term use has a potential side effect of decreasing testosterone, libido, energy, drive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, side effect, so I wanna make this clear. Uh, you know, if you're shooting dope, uh, you, you already got problems with your testosterone, right? So we're telling tell you how to go on Suboxone, you're like, it doesn't wanna, I don't want it to affect my sex drive. Well, you already have that problem. That being said, uh, when you have those complaints, please go to your doctor, uh, either they'll do it or send, send them to someone else. Uh, you get a free testosterone level, look at what your libido is at, and that could be easily corrected. Yeah. Um, okay, Doc, I, that's pretty much it. I mean, the only other thing is one, one question or one problem that I'm finding that my subscribers talk to me about is they're just worried about the, the pain patients, um, people who aren't, who aren't specifically in recovery. They're worried about the stigma of being on Suboxone. So I was just hoping we could just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, society's views on, on this sort of thing. And, and, and do you think, I guess maybe one more question, do you think that some, a pain patient going on this medication would get marked as an addict because it's on their, their medical record? But the, so, so first part of the question, yeah, it sucks, right? Society's views on, uh, on, on all this stuff. And that's why we work to educate. And well, there's two uh, areas where they're being ostracized. One within the substance abuse community, which is crazy, because if you go kind of the, you know, there's, you know, I'm not a 12 step guy. I have nothing bad to say about it, but that's not what I do. But I do know that from that community, there is a paradoxical kind of uh, irrational approach where, okay, uh, we're gonna embrace you and get you to recovery, but you're on this medication and so you're not sober. I'm just gonna leave it at that. So one, we need to educate the substance abuse community and really get them to change and shift their paradigm of what addiction is. The general public is the other area where we need to change their view and paradigm and shift it so they're, un look, understanding creates empathy and gives you a moral compass, okay? The smaller your reality is, the more violent you become, right? Uh, and, and I can show you this in a formal way. That being said, if I went to certain European countries, they would look at us like we're insane or we're in the dark ages <clears throat> in terms of addiction, amongst other things, okay? So what can we do about it? I can't, pro you know, I can't promise you you're not gonna be ostracized. I can't promise you you're gonna be treated well. But what, what can I do about that? <clears throat> educate, that's all I can do. Uh, I can educate as many people as I can I certainly do that with my patients, their surrounding environment, whether it's I get involved in their legal issues with the courts, with the judges, with the parole officers, whatever these things are, or with their family, or with their job. I try to educate as much as I can, and we should all kind of do that. And hopefully in time, that attitude and that view changes, because we need to change as a society for the, all the addicts to be able to get to a place of long-term recovery and be able to cope in their society so they can actually be successful. I don't have the magic solutions, but I just kind of work at it and try and get everyone to the same place. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, recovery is definitely worth it. I'm a lot happier now than I've ever been in my entire life. 
And I really appreciate you coming on and helping my community, our community, and uh, answering these questions for me. I know you're a busy guy. and Oh, it's our, it's our pleasure. And, you know, it's not really it's everybody's community, right? Uh, as I try to tell folks, whether it's the prison industrial complex that w uh, we all suffer the consequences of, you know, uh, I think we got 5% of the world's population and 85% or something of the world's uh, people incarcerated. It's kind of insane. All of us suffer from the consequences of that. In the same way, if we don't take care of those suffering from addiction, we're all going to suffer. So uh, the, these communities, the quicker everybody can get on the same page, the better the future will be for me, for you, for our kids, for the community, for our tax dollars, and for our general well-being. So it's my pleasure, and it's our community, and uh, I'm happy to be on, and thank you so much for having us on. All of us. I got a big team. So. Yeah, I think your team, they're great. Yeah, I can, Have you ever heard of uh, Gabor, Dr. Gabor Mate? Uh, yeah. Very familiar with his work, and I've uh, read him years before he got uh, famous. And before he was famous, we were able to exchange emails. Uh, I haven't tried for years. Uh, but uh, I share, uh, for the most part, uh, I'm very much in line with his position towards addiction. And I'm very interested in, uh, this stuff is great. I love talking about pharmacology and stuff, but I'm kind of over it. I've seen too many. Uh, I'm very interested in the sociology of addiction. And my real interest nowadays, as I'm getting older and tired, uh, is, uh, is how is addiction a symptom of our political economy? In particular, uh, the capitalist or the socialization of capitalism, which has contributed to addiction as a symptom of the greater pathology of our society. I think uh, Gabor Mate has the same position. I, I'm fully in line with that position, and hopefully once, uh, if I can ever afford it, that's what I'd like to delve into, and, and that's why we have the, the general mission and vision that we do is to change society and its views on addiction so that we can get there in a greater social sense as a complete community. And so, yes, I do know Gabor Mate very well. I love him. I was binge-watching your videos last night, and I, I love your philosophy about around this, and it kind of reminded me of, of a lot of his points too, of just, you know, the loneliness in society. And it all starts out very innocent. I mean, the first time I ever tried a, a painkiller, um, it was so like, I was just enveloped in this warmth and this is very um, calm feeling that I had never experienced before because I had a very traumatic childhood. And um, it just brought me so much peace and love. And that's where the root of all of this starts is at a very innocent place, you know, and it turns into something very dark. Um, but it, it, the root uh, of it, you, is, you, it you is. Set me off. Give me one second. A lot of this I uh, refer to a, a sociologist. His name is uh, Emil Durkheim. Okay. And, and he. Can you spell his last name? Uh, Durkheim. It's uh, D U R, I think, K. Dirk, Durkheim. Yeah, I am. Uh, something. You know, you can look it up. It's been years since I read Got him. It. And I'm going to. Yeah, it's amazing. And he wrote this seminal work. Uh, it's called Suicide, written over 100 years ago. His claim to fame with that piece is as the first guy who formalized social theory with statistics and data, okay? And one of the things he found, and there's a concept he calls on there, I think it's anime, which is lawlessness, okay? That's how he defines it. And, and the, the point of all of that is in societies, okay, and this really uh, connects to addiction, and it connects to our, uh, uh, you know, the capital economy, basically the socialization of our capitalistic economy. Suicide is more prevalent where there's a disconnection of human bonds. I mean, that's the extreme act of self-annihilation. Opiates, uh, that warmth feeling that you get is because you're living in, a, and again, I'm not taking the blame away from me, and I don't want to get into this discussion. It's, it's basically covering for that disconnectedness that we have as human beings from each other, the family, the tribe, and something greater than ourselves. 
Emil Durkheim showed very clearly that for you to sustain and grow as an individual, you need something bigger than yourself to be contributing to. If I start to get into the economic and political and social structure of our economy today, that's gone. Okay? Uh, everybody, it's gone. Okay? I'm not going to get into it. And so it's only natural to have such a deep, deep problem with opiate addiction. And so my problem in general is when I get these kids in and we get them, you know, I always say a monkey could get you sober. I can lock you up and not give you heroin for two months and I don't need an MD to do that. The real issue in recovery is one of my patients, I'm, I even told them this, I took care of them for two years, we finally got, it's like, what am I supposed to do? Get you sober and get you back in that crappy society and tell you, go get that job at 7-Eleven for the next 30 years working for 12 bucks an hour and that's what I'm putting you back into. That's the very reason you started using it in the first place. And the challenge for me is not to shut down and say, I give up, is to be able to create a society where they can actually prosper and achieve long-term sobriety. And for me, it is creating that human connectedness, that group connectedness, that sense of being around for a reason. All of that has a lot to do with opiate addiction. Let me read you a piece of a poem by, it's a French poet. His name is Jean Cocteau. And this is what he says about doing the opium, which is heroin, right? It's kind of cool. Everything one does in life, even love, occurs in an express train racing towards death. To smoke opium is to get out of the train while it is still moving. It is to concern oneself with something other than life or death. What's interesting here is that he's saying, you know, life can be so crappy that to smoke opium is to escape that life. Well, why should life be that crappy unless, as Emil Durkheim tells us, there is a disconnectedness between individuals, small groups, communities, and the greater society at large. I'm not going to go too much on this, uh, but uh, you, you set me off and I had to, uh, you, you don't have to put this in your video. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a huge part of it. It's a huge part of it. And, you know, there's a lot of lonely people in the world. And it seems like the more and more, the more and more technology we get, the more disconnected we are. And, you know, one thing that opiates do is they they prevent us from bonding um somehow it seems like almost and i'm no chemist or anything like that but it seems like it that maybe it messes with our oxytocin or something but we think we're bonding we're in that warm and loving feeling but it prevents us from bonding even more and we just become more and more disconnected hence the isolating we like to do as addicts and whatnot but i know you're a busy guy i'm gonna let you go now Very cool. I really appreciate all your time and attention today. And I think that this will help a lot of people. About 20% of my subscribers are people who are not addicts who come to me and ask me all these questions about pain and medicine and Suboxone. And I never this will be a great tool and a great resource for people. Also, how can people find you, Dr. B? Yeah, yeah, okay. my, yeah, my, I, I don't know. Uh, my okay. YouTube, uh, yeah, my YouTube channel. And there's, there's information on there, how are you? Yeah, there's phone numbers, I think. Uh, uh, there is our website to the medical group uh, and to the uh, IOP, Africare, and, you know, with Sober Living. So they can find us. There's also an email, getdrb at gmail.com. These guys kind of manage that. We do our best to respond to everybody. It's just becoming a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, YouTube channel and uh, yeah, YouTube channel. Go subscribe. They're telling me go subscribe to their YouTube. I'm gonna channel. go ahead and link your YouTube channel in the description box and in the comment section. And I'm also going to put Derek Lambert's um, uh, video that he made with you. And that video is all about the disease of addiction. So that way we can cover the pain part of it and we can cover the the addiction part of it all in one. I was um, I was yeah. told to mention the websites too. Oh, yes, 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 please. American-addiction.com, right? Uh, well, I will go ahead and put your link of your website in the description box in the comment section as well. And also, I noticed your motto was passion, commitment, service, integrity. And that's everything that I heard here today, and I really appreciate it.